The Syntax of Things by Arisha Chapter 55 Parentheses Family Trees Harry's eyes snapped open as he rolled over and crushed against something warm. Someone released a nonchalant grunt, and Harry looked up to see Snape giving him a disapproving glare before closing his eyes again. The darkness of the room was hardly disturbed by the fading light of the grey moon, which was now slowly retreating behind a cloud. Harry glanced at the clock on the nightstand. Three after midnight. What woke him up? Sorry, mumbled Harry. He tried to drift again to sleep, but as the seconds went by, he felt more and more awake. He gently squeezed Snape's arm, making sure he was still awake. When all this is over, he murmured, I'm going to sell Grimald and buy you a nice sunny little cottage. Snape pushed him away and Harry stretched. And I'll constantly bother you. Can you imagine me ringing your bell every day? Harry rubbed his eyes and felt at Romper's glasses. Outside the window, the moon emerged again behind the departing clouds, the clarity of the night sky seeming almost unreal. A faint smile appeared on Snape's lips, and he took a deep breath as though silently accepting that this was all the sleep he would get for tonight. Snape yawned and fixed his pillow, rolling on his side. Or we can live together, and you still pretend you hate me, complain about how much I irritate you, and how I'm insolent and stuff, and every night... Were you dreaming about this imbecility, or are you experiencing a delirium? Snape asked hoarsely. I think I was dreaming about it, Harry whispered honestly. Among other things, like what I'm going to do once Voldemort is gone. What you're going to do. Very thoughtful. You might not know it, but romanticism is my secret kink. I'm now touched. Thank you. Harry chuckled. Sawed off. You need to believe it, you know. That we're going to kill him. He can't stay alive forever. He came back from the dead once, Snape murmured. You're a pessimist. And you're young. I'm young, Harry confirmed confidently and yawned again. And I'm going to use all my magic to kill him if I have to. Snape's lip quirked upwards at that. What? You're so... awfully naive. You can barely understand your magic. Yeah, I can, Harry protested. Snape looked at him almost tenderly, and for a moment it seemed like he wasn't going to say anything. Then, when I was young, I had this passion for wild magic. My mother would teach herself spells, secretly. Dark spells, mostly. And I would watch her trying to repeat her wand motions with my bare hand. You ever made it? Harry shifted closer, pushing a dark strand of hair from Snape's face. Once. Half the basement was burned. Tobias was furious. You blame my mother. Harry tried to hold his curiosity back, but it was stronger than him. How did you die? It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. Certainly. Snape's eyes closed again. Harry continued, threading his fingers through Snape's hair, surprised that he hadn't been stopped yet. It felt nice. When I was six, Harry recalled, I punched my cousin in the face. He was chasing me in the backyard with his friends, and I was trying to run away. Then at some point, I couldn't stand it anymore, so I just stopped still, turned, and punched him. He flew all the way back to the back door, and he crashed against it. His cries were so loud. He chuckled at the memory. Yeah, but then you wasn't happy. I didn't know how I'd done it, so I told her maybe I had superpowers. You should have seen her face. To his surprise, Snape did laugh at that. He reached for his wand and cast a faint Loomis, placing the wand between them on the mattress and rubbing his eyes. How is she? Snape asked at last. Last time I saw her, she was thoroughly unhappy with her existence. Says the elf giant man, Harry thought of saying, but decided against it. That's her, he agreed. She's happy when Dudley gets good grades, though. Oh, and when Uncle Vernon lets her be. I don't think they even like each other anymore. Snape nodded, suddenly lost in some thought or memory that had completely sucked him in. Harry grinned as he recalled something spicy. Two years ago, I caught her having sex, he stated simply. Snape raised his brows warningly, but Harry could see that he was struggling to remain serious. With that fat beast, Snape blurted out and Harry grinned wider. Snape never struck him as a gossiper. Yeah, I didn't see them, but I heard them when I woke up to take a piss. I was traumatized for a week. I can imagine, Snape said carefully after a moment. Then, she was quite promiscuous back in the day. Harry 
goggled his eyes. Who, Aunt Petunia? Yes, she wasn't the magical one. She had to make use of other ways to attract attention. And suddenly there was more tension between them than Harry expected. The memory of his mother was almost visible, sitting on the bed with them. It occurred to Harry that Snape was holding his breath, regretting having said that. And what did the magical one do? Harry took a deep breath, determined not to let the moment ruin itself in the hands of Snape. So what, you mean she had a boyfriend and such? Because she goes to church every Sunday and blames the TV for corrupting the youth all day long, not to mention how she hates the neighbor's daughter for wearing short dresses. Does she now? Uh-huh. Her name's Linda, and I once got the impression that Dudley likes her, which of course made Aunt Petunia hate her even more. She wouldn't want Dudley to be around, you know, that sort of girls. I'm sure she wouldn't. What do you mean promiscuous? You've yet to seal the vocabulary book, then. Harry nudged Snape's chest. Tell me. There's nothing to tell. Oh, come on. Snape sighed. He picked Harry's hand from his chest and placed it back on his head. Harry resumed stroking Snape's hair softly. If I tell you, Snape drawled, you must promise me, and I mean it, Potter, I'll know if you lie, that you will never speak a word of it to anyone. Harry nodded back, suddenly deadly curious. Deal. Your word, boy. You have my word, Professor Snape. Promise. Snape ignored his mockery and began. It was summer. I was fourteen. She was sixteen, I believe. I had gone over to the Evans house for lunch and... They'd invite you for lunch? My grandparents? He hadn't thought that his grandparents knew Snape, but it did make sense, come to think of it. For some reason, Harry had always assumed they wouldn't really approve of his mum's friendship with him, though. Don't interrupt me, Potter. Yes, I was invited, and as soon as we sat down to eat, we realized Petunia was, as usual, late. You've got to tell me everything you know about my grandparents right after, said Harry impatiently. I told you not to interrupt me, Severus warned, his tone far from convincing. So, as I was saying, Lily... Lily asked me to go find her because she knew it would piss Petunia off to have me scold her. It didn't make her furious, and it had also pleased Lily a great deal. Harry snorted and Snape smiled. I went out looking for her, but she was nowhere to be seen. I looked everywhere but at the treehouse, which I thought of lastly. She was there. Snape made a pause, and Harry suspected that he wanted to add suspense to the moment. Despite the countless questions, Harry had he restrained himself from interrupting again. She was with a boy, pleasuring him. Harry's jaw dropped, and he felt his grin slowly fall to a pain grimace. He tried very hard not to gag at both as the very image was not coping well with his mind. He had never saw Aunt Petunia capable of... of... You're not serious. No, no, you're joking. You're messing with me. His hand slipped from Snape's hair and pushed Snape's wand away, distancing the light from his face to hide his blushing. Oh, what did you do? Snape smirked. What could I do? I never told anyone, although I did mercilessly nurture her sense of indebtedness for years. I made a point of proposing that she comes and plays with me at the treehouse every time I came across her. The blush of shame on her face was all I needed to satisfy my sick amusement. It also kept her from talking Lily into breaking our friendship for the best part of my adolescence. You're evil, choked Harry, torn between an impulse to wretch and another impulse to break into spasmodic laughter. What the- God, why did you tell me that? Snape shrugged his shoulders innocently. You asked. Of all the things you could have told- no, just no, you're sick. No. Ugh. Harry shook his head in an attempt to shoot the mental image away. Snape snorted, and Harry raised a hand. Just don't tell me anything like this again. Ever. The fake innocence hadn't been wiped off Snape's face yet. You mean you don't want to know what she did with the theater usher when she was 17? No! Harry covered his face in an attempt to black out the world. He felt his cheeks heating up. Not in Petunia, he said miserably. I don't understand how she never mentioned you. Mm, perhaps she feared I'd mention her back, Snape said sulkily. Stop. 
Harry grunted. If you're so keen to talk about people's romances, why don't you tell me about you then? I mean, after, you know, he gathered quickly. Snape took a deep breath. I've had a matchmaking once. It was Lucius's idea, and it had been suspicious of me to refuse the arrangement. She was rich, a pureblood, black hair, quite elegant, twenty-something back then. We stopped seeing each other when I couldn't stand her anymore. She was the stupidest woman I'd ever met. Lucius. Lucius Malfoy. Harry felt disgusted. Your friends. Acquaintances. So what? Was she a Malfoy too? What's her name? Snape raised an eyebrow in a you-really-thought-I-would-tell-you manner. Harry pushed through his irritation nevertheless. And what else? There's nothing else. I mean, where are your dirty details? Where they are supposed to be, away from your curiosity. Now, if you don't mind, and if I have entertained you enough, I would really like to go back to sleep. Yes, hissed Harry as Snape turned on his other side far away from him. And thanks for sharing my aunt's adventures with me. Harry said sourly. I'm sure I'm going to have amazing dreams thanks to you. I aim to please. Knox. It was after a long time, and Harry had almost drifted to sleep under the blanket when he remembered to talk again. Summers, he whispered. Snape was probably already nearly asleep himself when he sighed in acknowledgement. I love you, said Harry. Snape didn't answer immediately. Harry didn't think he was going to, then... But not enough to let me sleep. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm. Your books. Severus handed him the textbooks for his seventh year, knowing very well that he wouldn't be needing them. Harry flipped through a random one to take a look. I'm not taking arithmancy. He complained. Wait, you bought this yourself? You didn't have to. The headmaster bought them. Severus lied. Unless you thought I'd waste more of my time trying to satisfy your needs. Harry rolled his eyes and Severus felt the familiar Potter-related anger build up inside him. He couldn't even insult the boy anymore. He'd become useless. It occurred to Severus that the despair with which Harry was examining his new books was fairly true to the level of education the boy had received over the years. Harry Potter's spirit was defective by all means, non-existent perhaps, a mind whose doors had been closed shut because of stubbornness and bad luck. After a minute, Harry tossed the books into his trunk and pushed it closed with a foot. You still have to tell me about my grandparents, said Harry. Severus cringed. Part of him struggled hard against covering his face with both hands in shame at the memory of how effortlessly he had exposed his past to the boy last night. Years of secrecy and vigilance had been erased by a mere night of weakness. At the curious look that was now piercing him, Severus barely managed to scowl. He did make, however, a mental note never to allow himself to have any kind of personal discussion with Harry Bloody Potter ever again. They were muggles, Severus simply said. That's not what I asked. Get up, we'll practice. How did they die? They're dead, aren't they? Why hasn't anyone told me anything about them? Enough, Potter, up. Harry stood, although visibly annoyed. He should really teach the boy how to hide his emotions. You said you'd tell me. What changed now? And even after all their interactions, Harry still trusted Severus to tell him the truth. It was hard not to laugh, but not impossible. I am pretty certain I would have said anything to have my quietness back. When a repressed teenager pokes and kicks at me at four after midnight with a sudden desire for small talk, I believe it is reasonable for me to lie. He made a small pause to observe Harry's features and was glad to see the embarrassment beginning to show. Now I can simply inform you that I'm not planning to become your storyteller, so you better drop it. Ready? Harry dragged his feet to the middle of the room boringly. My theory is still valid, you know. What theory? asked Severs before he could help it. Harry smiled. That you're far more cooperative in bed. Severus was shocked for the space of a heartbeat, then... The gentlemen's! They weren't exactly normal, Severus heard himself saying after they had eaten their sandwiches. The kitchen table was rather small, and Severus couldn't help but think that this place had been made for dwarves. They looked upon wizards with too much enthusiasm, even with loneliness sometimes. 
Were he eating with anyone else, he would have made a point of the terrible table manners as Harry dropped his fork and pushed his plate aside to concentrate on Severus. Right now, he was so taken aback by his own desire to talk that he didn't have a mind to mention anything else. All the reasons he shouldn't be saying any of these things to Harry Potter remained tangible before him. He had, however, already begun. They learned that Lily was a rich very early. I was the one who proved it to them. She said they didn't believe her, so I showed them. Our wild magic was so easy for us to summon that soon enough. A letter arrived to soothe down her parents' worries and explain to them the situation. They were nice memories, but Severus had little faith in nostalgia. It brought to the surface parts of himself that were easy to break. Already broken, maybe. Petunia wanted to be like us. I was exceptionally antisocial, she'd said once. Generally unwanted, coming from a poverty-stricken working-class family. So she couldn't understand why I had a gift that she didn't. She grew jealous of Lily over the years, although that would have happened anyway, magic or not. What do you mean? Harry asked. Petunia was determined. She liked rules, control. Lily instead was wild. She knew no boundaries, like you. She wanted to break through her limits whenever she touched them. The worst thing to her was when she wasn't allowed to do something she knew she could. It was maddening her. That's why she was good at potions. And because she was using Severus's notes most of the time, but that needn't be thought. Did they like you? Severus smiled sadly at the particular memory of Lily's mother telling him how Lily talked about him all the time. I was their daughter's best friend. I suppose they had to. When we came back from our first year at Hogwarts, we spent the entire night telling them about everything we had been taught. They were mesmerized. All their lives, they thought magic didn't exist, and then they were suddenly part of it. They were happy. How did they die? I don't know. I... Lily and I weren't talking anymore when it happened. Oh. Harry's gaze fell on the table for a second. So you don't know at all? How could he? He was a Death Eater. He would have killed them himself if the Dark Lord ordered him to. I'm afraid not. They liked my mum more than Aunt Petunia, didn't they? They liked her powers. To their eyes, they had given birth to a miracle, a demigoddess. Petunia was ordinary, Severus knew that, and their parents knew it too. Ordinary children were doomed to suffer with or without magical blood in the family. It was a dichotomy between equally loving all children and secretly having a favorite one. What the Evanses were missing was that such secrets never remained hidden. It was instinct itself that would make the truth painfully vivid and unmistakable. Petunia knew it. Of course she knew it. Their parents never admitted it, not even to themselves, perhaps. But at the disdain and the jealousy on Petunia's adolescent face, it was written clearly— the family loved one of them more, and it wasn't Petunia. Then again? Possibly. Were you three the only children in the neighborhood? There were others. Muggles. I couldn't see why I would want to waste my time on that. Muggles are fine, said Harry, but quickly added, And anyway, I don't think my mom would ever avoid muggles, even if you did. She was tolerant. It's not that she'd avoid muggles, it's that she had Severus, and so she didn't need anyone else. Lily was his for a few years. They spent their summers together talking, playing, discovering the world. Then she was Potter's girl, and she was suddenly inviting him over for the summer. Severus could see them strolling around the filthy river Lily and he used to go to when they were young, sitting under the trees Severus had shown her, reading the books Severus had given her, and sharing secrets Severus didn't know— James Potter had crossed ways with him once. He'd raised his Mont Hex Severus there at Spinner's End outside his own home to humiliate him in front of Lily once again, of course. And she, she was tugging on Potter's sleeve and was muttering, Let's go, leave him alone, stop! Eager to flee the scene and continue her date with Potter somewhere else. Severus had hated her. He had truly and wholeheartedly hated her for a few days. My grandparents, were they, did they dislike people like me? People who were, he took a breath, gay people. Did they hate them? Because my aunt does. Seeking acceptance from the dead, Severus would fail to see the point of it if he hadn't fallen in the same trap himself when Lily died. How would I know? He spat irritated. Harry snorted. Right. 
James Potter and Sirius Black, on the other hand, had a particular abhorrence for boofs as far as Severus could remember. He shut his mouth around the information before it could escape him. It wouldn't do any good. Severus levitated the plates to the sink, washed his hands, and walked off to the main room to wear his cloak. You might have to stay by yourself tomorrow. Do not have a breakdown, and do not lose your nerve during my absence, no matter what conjectures you might reach to pass your time. It's an order. Just bring me biscuits when you come back, Harry said as he leaned against the door. Severus forgot to look disgusted. 